a precious heirloom. This was once the property of George Washington. You're a VIP. <laughs> yeah. And the pride of a modest family. My father was a truck driver. We got along, but we were very frugal. So how did she end up with Washington's wallet? Are you a descendant of George Washington? No, I'm not. It's quite a long story. A story about love of country. We want these things because we want a connection to these men. The allure of big bucks. I established a value for the wallet. There was a lot of money. And some good old-fashioned intrigue. Someone took the wallet and disappeared. I'm Jamie Colby, and today I'm crossing the Delaware River from Pennsylvania into New Jersey. Yes, I'm following the route that General George Washington took to his big victory during the Revolutionary War, the Battle of Trenton. I'm tracking down what I believe is the most intriguing strange inheritance I've heard of so far, something the father of our country may have been carrying that fateful night, his wallet. My name is Barbara Farwell, and this is my daughter, Linda. I inherited something from my mother, and one day my daughter will inherit it from me. For reasons that will become clearer as we follow the twists and turns of this story, the Farwells have let their heirloom go on display right here in Trenton. Barbara. How are you? I'm Jamie. So, so nice to meet, to meet you. you. Hi, Linda. How Hi. are you? I'm fine. So where'd you bring me? This is the old barracks museum. And you keep something from your family here? Yes, we do. Come yes. in. During the Revolutionary War, this building housed British and Hessian soldiers. In fact, it was the target on Christmas night in 1776 when General George Washington and his men quietly crossed the Delaware and launched a surprise attack on the enemy troops who were stationed here. An attack that turned the tide of the revolution and changed the course of world history. There it is. And here we are. So this is it. It's amazing. It says 1775. Were the initials added by your family? No, I think that was way back when that was made. Are you a descendant of George Washington? No, I'm not. It's quite a long story. A story that begins back in the 1700s, when large wallets like this, or pocketbooks as they're called, are essential accessories for important men like Washington. What strikes you about Washington when it comes to money? Well, he was a wealthy man, but it was mostly in land. So in terms of cash, that was always a problem for him. Apropos of a tale about Washington's wallet, biographer Richard Brookheiser tells me that the great man's career revolved more than anything around money. The Revolutionary War is sparked by cries of no taxation without representation. And for Washington, raising an army is easier than raising the dough to pay it. He sees his men without shoes. He sees them without the weapons they need. And he sees them not being paid. And he is the man who's at the center of all this and trying to cope. Washington's ultimate victory doesn't end his country's economic woes. What do we know about the overall economic stability of our nation at that time? Wars are always expensive. The revolution was no exception. And by the end of it, the United States was broke. General Washington can't feel much better off. He discovers his Mount Vernon estate and his massive agricultural enterprise have been mismanaged in his absence. Washington is back at Mount Vernon, which he's only visited once in eight and a half years of war. He has to get it up and running again. He hires this man to help, and 24-year-old Harvard graduate Tobias Lear will play a key part in this strange inheritance tale. Can you tell me about Tobias Lear and what his role was? Washington needs assistance, and Tobias Lear is one of the people who does that for him. Before long, duty calls Washington again to become president of a tottering nation 
that, among other things, isn't paying its bills. And Tobias Lear goes along for the ride. Washington puts him in charge of his bookkeeping, a job that for the next seven years engenders a close bond. That's a real relationship of trust then between Washington and Lear. Absolutely. President Washington does put the nation's finances on firmer footing. No wonder he's on the $1 bill. It's also why I think inheriting his wallet, of all things, is so cool. No surprise that the first person it passes to, the story goes, is Tobias Lear, who stays at Washington's bedside at Mount Vernon on the night of December 14th, 1799, when the former president dies at age 67. But the modern day heirs in this strange inheritance story, the Farwell ladies, are not descendants of Tobias Lear either. They invite me back to their home in Morrisville, Pennsylvania, right across the Delaware River to connect the dots. My father was a truck driver. We got along, but we were very frugal. My mother was an excellent homemaker, pretty good cook, and she was a hard worker. She also has a little secret. Where did your mom keep the wallet? In a little black box, squirreled away somewhere. After the break, the improbable path of Washington's wallet, if in fact, it's really his. She is 100% convinced this is George Washington's pocketbook. Are you? But first, our strange inheritance quiz question. After adjusting for inflation, who's the richest man ever elected president? George Washington, John F. Kennedy, or Donald Trump? So, who's the richest man elected president? By a long shot, it's C. Donald Trump broke the record set by George Washington, who in today's money had an estimated $525 million. Trump's net worth in 2017 was estimated by Forbes magazine to be $3.7 billion. That makes him seven times as rich as Washington. How neat must it be to possess a piece of history like this wallet owned by the Farwell family with the initials GW and the year 1775? He's the father of the country. Richard Brookheiser is author of books on several founding fathers, including George Washington. What do those items from our past leaders add to our American history? Well, it makes them vivid to see actual objects that they held, that they had, that they used. Uh, that makes them like us because we all have similar things. We want these things because we want a connection to these men. I've seen that time and again on Strange Inheritance. But the tricky part's proving that thing in Grandpa's attic is the real deal. The questions raised in episode after episode did those guns actually belong to Bonnie and Clyde? Did JFK really sign those letters? Did General Pickett indeed wear that blood-stained uniform? The fancy term auctioneers and appraisers use is provenance. I'd put it this way. How can the Farwells be sure their beloved family heirloom really is George Washington's wallet? Did the wallet come with any documentation? There was a letter, and it tells the whole story of how it came. It's actually an affidavit that's more than a century old, written by a lawyer named Alfred Bennett. Linda, who was Alfred Bennett? My great-great-grandfather? Yeah. The letter addressed to whom it may concern and signed by Bennett in June 1900 traces the wallet back to the selling of the estate of one of the family of Tobias Lear, private secretary to George Washington. And it concludes, This pocketbook, to the best of my knowledge and belief, was once the property of George Washington. You've heard how Lear is said to have inherited Washington's wallet. What happens next? In 1816, Lear commits suicide and according to the affidavit, the wallet passes to one of his heirs, likely his widow, Frances. When that heir dies, a man named Stacy Hall handles the estate, 
and the letter says takes possession of the wallet. When he dies, Barbara's ancestor, attorney John Bennett, gets it. From there, it passes to John's son, Alfred, author of the affidavit, who bequeaths it to his daughter, Jane, who passes it to her daughter, Elva Kiernan. And Elva Kiernan is Barbara Farwell's mother. She treasures it as though it's the most valuable thing she has. It probably is. Was she proud of it? Yes. Where did your mom keep the wallet? In a little black box squirreled away somewhere. And inside the wallet are two old paper bills that may well have been Washington's. Sadly, Elva doesn't have the wherewithal to properly display the wallet or to protect it from theft or damage. So in 1960, she proudly lends it to the nearby Washington Crossing Museum. To see it on display and to bring your friends to see it. Ooh, you, that belongs to you. <laughs> But things turn sour in 1976 when the museum renovates for the bicentennial. Barbara is dismayed to find the wallet's been removed. When I took my friends to see it, to brag about it, where's the wallet? Barbara's mom is beside herself. She wanted more people to see it around that time. I am taking the wallet to another museum, and she did. Score one for Jersey. Elva crosses the Delaware and lends the wallet to the old Barracks Museum here in Trenton. They'll display it, and she can take it out anytime she likes. Would you not want it here as the center of a coffee table? No way. <laughs> Why not? I just was afraid something would happen to it. A legitimate fear. In January 1992, Barbara's mother is staggered by a call from the museum. It's surprising she didn't have a stroke. Who swiped Washington's wallet? That's next. Here's another quiz question for you. George Washington had no biological children. What president had the most? Was it George H.W. Bush, Teddy Roosevelt, or John Tyler? Extra credit if you can guess how many. The answer when we return. So, which U.S. president had the most kids? The answer is C, John Tyler. 15 children by two wives. It's January 1992. 83-year-old widow Elva Kiernan gets a devastating phone call from the old barracks museum in Trenton, New Jersey. Her precious heirloom, a leather wallet identified as George Washington's, has been stolen from its case. Someone took the wallet and disappeared. The New Jersey detectives and the police were on the lookout for it. Did you post a reward? Yes. The total was 1000 500 from my mother and 500 from the barracks. It's all Elva can afford, and presumably the barracks, too. Weeks go by. Then, it's back. A local lawyer followed an anonymous tip and secures the wallet's return on President's Day, 1992. And this is classic. The 200-year-old bills, presumably Washington's, are missing. I was upset because I knew as a child I had seen the bills many, many times. Did the lawyer ever disclose who brought him the no. wallet? Do you remember, Linda, if there was any information about who actually returned the wallet? No. But you gave it back to the museum. Yes. Mm -hmm. That is, after the museum agrees to install a security system. And there it stays for the next decade, until the Farwells finally decide to have it insured. The first time I saw it was at one of my antique appraisal events. Lori Verderame is an antiques appraiser with a PhD in art history. You established a value for the wallet? Based on comparable sales records, condition, provenance, and also my research, the insurance appraisal that I signed, the pocketbook here was worth $75,000. It was a lot of money. Enough to give any working class family pause. That much money would really be a nice addition to our bank account. <laughs> but my mother was very sure that that wallet shouldn't ever be sold. It should be for everybody to see. 
In fact, Elva makes it all the way to 100 and never sells. She passes away in October 2008. Barbara not only inherits the wallet, but the cachet that comes with it when she takes her bridge club to the old barracks for a personalized tour. Tell me about it, when you're able to share it with the ladies at the senior center. Well, they're amazed. You're a VIP. <laughs> yeah. That pride in her family's small connection to the father of the country is why she agrees to tell her story to Strange Inheritance. But will our questions spoil everything? I'm just curious, once we decided to do an episode of Strange Inheritance, whether your thoughts about it changed in any way. I honestly did look in the files. That's next. What's your strange inheritance story? We'd love to tell it. Send me an email or go to our website, strangeinheritance.com. Now back to Strange Inheritance. I certainly enjoy being the owner and being known as a celebrity. Something curious happened after Barbara Farwell and her daughter Linda agreed to let us tell the story about how their family inherited George Washington's wallet. They keep it in Trenton's old barracks museum, displayed above a decades-old plaque which flatly states it belonged to the father of our country. But when we asked to shoot inside the museum, a member of its staff tells us that now they're no longer sure if that's accurate. Uh-oh. I'm wondering whether you took a second look at it and whether your thoughts about it changed in any way. I honestly did look in the files. We did not have an exact paper trail that goes right to 1775. Richard Patterson is the director of the Old Barracks Museum. We don't have a receipt from Washington. If we had a paper trail that went back a century or more, when you have some items that are attributed to a particular person, particularly a famous person, that sort of adds to the level of documentation that you would like to have. It appears to be authentic to the period, and um, it's something that quite plausibly was carried by Washington. Mild-mannered Barbara can't believe the museum, after all these years, is waffling on the wallet? I really am very sure that that's George Washington's pocketbook. Plausibly just doesn't cut it for her. Washington biographer Richard Brookheiser understands. Is it okay if we just believe it or do we really need to know for sure? No, we want to know for sure. And we do know for sure, insists appraiser Lori Verderaim. I ask her to make her case. The first thing we're going to look for is age. I'm also going to look for construction. The binding is just like what we would typically see. It's made the same way Cambridge University would actually make its books. The age of the leather is correct, and these little bands indicate where it was kept and what was in it. Another key detail? If you'll notice that sunburst in between the monogram of the G and the W? Yes. George Washington was part of the Freemasons, and that particular sunburst is an image in the 18th century that was also used by the Freemasons. Had Washington lived in another age, it might be easier to remove all doubt if he'd been photographed with the wallet or if you could swab it for his DNA. But Dr. Lori says that for a 240-year-old artifact, you'll rarely do better than her final piece of proof. So this is where people say, oh, we don't have a document? We do have a document. That affidavit attesting to the chain of custody from Washington to Farwell's ancestors. Never sold, right? No, never sold. Okay. Always handed down the family. That provenance, Dr. Lori adds, has never been challenged by anyone outside the Farwell family. Has Dr. Lori persuaded you? The initials and so on look like they were done quite some time ago. In a graceful denouement, Richard Patterson seems to buy it. Dr. Lori is 100% convinced this is George Washington's pocketbook. Who? Cool. Are you? Why not? I was leaning in that direction. Barbara Farwell is also pleased to hear Dr. Lori thinks the wallet could fetch a higher price if she wants to sell. Value has increased and condition has basically stayed the same because it's been protected in a museum environment. So I would appraise this George Washington pocketbook for $100,000. But Barbara and Linda still say their strange inheritance is not for sale. 
Why is it more important to own the wallet than to sell it and have the money? Because my mother really wanted us to keep it and pass it down through the ages. It'll be more valuable and more interesting as the years go by. What happens if Linda sells it? She said she wouldn't. <laughs> I won't. I think I understand it now. <laughs> I wouldn't take it now without an escort. <laughs> what is it you're worried will happen to it? Well, I don't want it to get stolen again, that's for sure. But did you not say you'd like to see it in the Smithsonian? Yeah, eventually. And that's where millions of people would see it. Yeah. Word traveled fast of Washington's victories after he crossed the Delaware, with or without that wallet in his vest pocket. Frederick the Great of Prussia said, the achievements of Washington and his little band of men were the most brilliant ever recorded in the annals of military achievements. The father of our country went for broke and pulled it off, and so handed down an inheritance to all Americans. I'm Jamie Colby. Thanks so much for watching Strange Inheritance. And remember, you can't take it with you.